Uh, and with that, uh, please welcome Admiral Gilday. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for yes, having sir. me. Um, this is my first time uh, speaking at this event. In the so, mosh pit. Yeah, yes, in, sir. In, Very in affectionate. Uh, and certainly in the pit. It, it, but it is one of the silver linings of COVID, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> yes, in sir. In terms of uh, how we can have a thousand people or so participate in this discussion today. Yes, sir. What I thought I'd do uh, is instead of delivering it prepared remarks, to talk about three areas briefly and then let's dive into what I would expect to be uh, a series of difficult questions that, that we can have a good dialogue about. Uh, the three areas I wanted to talk about briefly, um, what the Navy's been doing for the past year and what we're delivering right now uh, in terms of our operations abroad. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about briefly um, is our collaboration with industry, that relationship over the past year. And for both our operations and our relationship with industry, talk about the silver lining that COVID has given us uh, and uh, look at it through, through the lens of a glass half, half full. And then uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the Navy, the, the budget environment without specifically talking about the budget, if I can. Uh, my thoughts on the Navy's investment strategy, where I really think we need to put our, our money to deliver the most most uh, lethal and ready capability to the nation. Yes, sir. So with respect to the Navy and what we've been doing over the past year, so we've been operating at a pretty good op tempo, about 30 to 35 percent of the fleet underway at any given day. Most of that fleet pushed forward and deployed at the tactical edge where it must be, um, I believe, strongly, uh, you know, is one of my priorities is readiness, uh, that we need a ready Navy forward for all the reasons that COCOMs have talked about in the past four to six weeks in their testimony. Um, and so most of that, most of that firepower, it has, firepower has been forward. Um, uh, we've done some uh, significant, uh, have a few significant events in the past year. I'll just touch on a few. One is a successful standard missile engagement of an ICBM. Uh, the second was a big exercise that we just had, a uh, large, uh, uh, large scale exercise with unmanned and manned uh, off of the California coast. Um, and then uh, in terms of what we're doing right now, of course, the Eisenhower is, uh, is in the Middle East and providing overwatch during the uh, uh, tenuous uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan um, to make sure that we've got proper air cover for our forces as, as we uh, steadily withdraw. Yes, uh, we also have an ARG, uh, the Iwo Jima ARG, that's uh, up in the high north in the Norwegian Sea, and she's doing an exercise with NATO partners. Uh, the high north is an area where it's no longer rare that we're doing operations up there. So over the past 12 to 18 months, some 20 operations or exercises in the high north and the Arctic. And uh, most of those have been done uh, uh, joint and multi, multilateral. Uh, and certainly a number of them with the Coast Guard, uh, the Air Force, and the, uh, and the Marine Corps. Um, and then we also have uh, the Theodore Roosevelt was in the South China Sea just a couple of weeks ago. Now she's off the, uh, actually in the Gulf of Alaska with the Macon Island ARG, and they're actually uh, doing a joint exercise up there with, uh, with the Air Force uh, up in the cold. And then we also have uh, ships that are operating and doing an exercise with the French, uh, the Australians, and the Japanese in the Western Pacific right now. So we're delivering all of that during the pandemic. And uh, we've learned a lot in the past year. We've been able to maintain a very low positivity rate across the force. Right now, it's less than one-tenth of one percent. So yes, 400 sailors positive out of almost 350,000. And we've maintained that for months and months and months. Um, but the success of that and what we've been able to deliver forward really comes down to what I believe is uh, uh, individual responsibility that sailors have taken. And it's exactly the kind of behavior, uh, responsible behavior that you, that you would expect and that you would want them to aspire to, not only holding themselves to the standards that we expect, but also uh, their shipmates to the left and to the right of them. Uh, I think that there's been a cultural change at sea in terms of how we operate, whether it's on ships, submarines, or in our aviation squadrons uh, because of the pandemic. But um, uh, by and large, it has worked out really, really well. Uh, and I. I just can't thank, thank the families. And I know there are some people that are viewing that have active duty family members, some of them maybe in the Navy. Uh, and, what, and that support that you've given our sailors over the past year um, has been magnificent. So thank you for that. In terms of our relationship with industry, um, as most out there are probably aware, there is typically an opaque curtain 
that runs down the 395 corridor between Crystal City and the Pentagon. And uh, I'd say that um, one of the silver linings of COVID has, we, we've seen that opaque curtain lift, uh, uh, not to a small degree, but to a great degree, where we've been working very closely with industry on a week to week basis, particularly with uh, a couple of areas. One is supply chain. Yes, uh, so not understanding how that, not only understanding how that affects production lines, uh, and, and so setting the Navy's expectation for challenges that, uh, uh, that we might expect over the, over the past year. Uh, but also with respect to supply chains and particularly with overseas suppliers, a much better understanding where that brittleness is and how we need to work with industry to mitigate that. Um, Secretary Gertz, who spoke to the audience yesterday, was in a, <laughs> is in a very rigid uh, week to week drumbeat um, uh, and phone calls and, and video teleconferences with CEOs of major defense firms. And so um, it's our hope that that kind of behavior and that relationship continues. And I aspire to be a trusted customer of industry and likewise, I, I would expect the same. Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, Secretary Gertz talked about the speed of trust. I would uh, foot stomp that in terms of how we need to, how we need, we shouldn't be satisfied. As good as things have been within that silver lining over the past year, I don't think we should be satisfied with where we are, but we ought to continue to press and press and press. And uh, you know, I want to open doors for industry to be able to deliver, to creatively deliver uh, stuff that we can field quickly and reliably, reliably and affordably uh, for our sailors out in the fleet. Last thing um, that I'll touch on before we get to Q&A uh, is the budget environment. And so- Yes, sir. I really look at my responsibility, our responsibility uh, as leaders in the Navy as fielding the absolutely best, lethal, capable, ready force that we can uh, given the top line that uh, Congress gives us. Uh, and so our budget proposal to Congress really falls around four different areas. And uh, the first is readiness and training. That has been a priority for me since I took the job. And I've always believed that uh, if we get in a scrap tonight, that the fleet is gonna perform at the level of, uh, the level that we have trained them and that we have prepared yes. them. And so that, that remains critically important for us. Um, as has been our getting after uh, maintenance. And so not only within the aviation community, we've been on a very healthy readiness recovery trajectory, but also the surface in the submarine force. And so what we've seen despite COVID over the past year or so uh, is a reduction in our public shipyards of delay days. Um, and, and as most probably know, 18 to 24 months ago, we were only delivering ships out of maintenance on time 30 to 35% of the time. Yes, sir. In our public yards, we've reduced uh, those delay days by 80%. We're down from 7,000 plus delay days down to just over 1,000. And uh, in the private yards, we're uh, over 60%. Uh, and we're not satisfied with either. We need to continue to drive uh, to, to get rid of those um, delay days. Certainly, there's plenty within the lifelines of the Navy that we know we have to get after and have been getting after. And this is not by lathering it with more money, but rather getting, getting after process, and, and, and which a much more rigorous and disciplined approach. Moving contracts from 30 days before maintenance availability out to 120. I think right now we're in the high 90s, maybe around 97 days. Our goal is 120. Uh, to set those expectations with industry, we've moved ships from Mayport, Florida, uh, between Mayport, Florida and Norfolk, uh, Virginia, as an example, to keep like ships in the same ports so that we can give a high degree of predictability to, uh, to private shipyards uh, in terms of getting, those, getting like ships through maintenance at a steady drumbeat so that they can keep a, sustain a workforce that's predictable. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and with respect to training, um, uh, we have put an awful lot of effort into um, maturing our distributed maritime operations concept. And so with every deploying strike group in ARG, we are doing fleet battle problems that rigorously test an aspect of, uh, of, of those operating concepts. We've been doing that for four or five years now. I think we have a really good understanding of how we're gonna fight. Um, yes, and that has, uh, that has really paid dividends in terms of informing uh, what we're going to fight with uh, in terms of some of the analysis we've done over the past year or so. Uh, the second area is capabilities and uh, briefly what I'm, I'm really focused on is um, with the fleet that we have today, how do we, 
how do we get as much lethality and um, operational availability out of, out of the fleet that we have today? Making significant investments in hypersonics, as an example, making yes, significant sir. investments in directed energy or laser technology. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention over the past year, it has been a success story, has been the successful uh, engagement of a, of, an, of a target aircraft with uh, shipboard directed energy systems. Um, and so the, 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 the third capability would be people. Uh, the third piece would be people. Um, heavy investment in ready relevant learning, which is really 21st century approach to training uh, and education for our force, as well as a live uh, uh, virtual construct. And so that is collaboration with the gaming industry so that we can do large scale exercises uh, again and again and again uh, in a virtual environment. We're gonna do a large scale exercise this summer. It'll be the biggest exercise that we've done in a generation with a number of strike groups and ARGs and a good portion of that is also gonna be virtual. And then the last area is capacity. And so uh, based on the budget that we have and, and so, so the different scenarios might be uh, uh, a budget that, uh, that rises above the rate of inflation, perhaps with additional growth. Another might be a flat line, a third, a third might be declining. And so based on those different scenarios, we take a look at how do we make those investments across those four areas that I talked about. But at the end of the day, you know, what we, what we, the, the ends that we are trying to achieve, the objective is to field that force that is lethal, capable, and, uh, uh, and ready. Um, and I just, uh, as, we, as, as I wrap up my comments, um, Jim, what I'd like to do is just spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the analysis we've done with the Marine Corps, with OSD CAPE, and with the joint staff in the past year, and how that has set the foundation for the shipbuilding plan that was submitted late in 2020. Um, and so that analysis, uh, again, in terms of how we fight, was grounded on distributed maritime operations and the Marine Corps' uh, littoral operations concepts, as well as uh, their uh, expeditionary advanced basing concept that I'm sure the Commandant will talk about next. And that's maturing nicely and has actually been the basis of the how we're going to fight piece. Uh, as well as, I think the national defense strategy also played in significantly into that analysis with respect to our responsibilities for, for posturing a Navy globally that can defend the homeland, that can deter strategically, deter conventionally, that can be able to respond to threats and, and give national command authorities options. Uh, that can assure allies and partners, and I mentioned some of the exercises we're doing today. And then uh, lastly, to be able to compete below the, the level of uh, armed conflict uh, against uh, near, pair, near pair adversaries. So, um, so that has been a, uh, that has been, uh, uh, that, that analysis that we did was the underpinning of the, sh the shipbuilding plan. And I think what the analysis gave us, besides a number north of, of 355, you had mentioned 355, um, it actually gave us a better understanding of what the composition of the fleet needs to be yes, sir. Uh, based on how we think we're going to fight uh, to give us a better understanding of what we need to fight with in terms of capabilities and platforms. Uh, and so that folded into the shipbuilding plan. And the reason why that shipbuilding plan is really important, it's not just important for industry to give them a set of headlights with some predictability on what we think our requirements are looking out 10 years with, with a decent degree of fidelity, but beyond that, to inform their infrastructure and their, their manning and, and training uh, uh, plans that they need to sustain. Um, but I think also um, it, allowed us to, um, it allowed us to provide Congress with a good informed view of yes, where sir. we think the Navy of the future has to be. Yes, sir. We've done a lot of work on um, We've done a lot of work on the uh, uh, unmanned piece. I, I mentioned the large scale exercise we did off the West Coast last month, uh, but also the unmanned framework where we pulled together all of the unmanned platform efforts that we have ongoing in order to understand better where we need to double down and where we need to sundown those programs so that we can get to a place later on this decade where we can actually, where we're confident enough to scale. And the two big areas that we're trying to get after, quite frankly, are reliability yes, uh, and command and control. And then there's a, a, a project that I have ongoing called uh, um, Task Force Overmatch that is taking a look at uh, with a number of spirals this year in terms of tests uh, on how we can 
how we can provide a network of a, 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 a uh, software defined network of networks off yes, which sir. we can fight off of with a hybrid fleet of manned and unmanned. Um, the last thing I'd mention with respect to the budget environment is uh, we are also making investments in three big strategic areas. The first, of course, is the Columbia or the next SSBN. We have to deliver that, uh, that program on time yes, in sir. 2028. Um, the uh, Ohio's are getting old and we need to replace them. Uh, the second strategic area is investment in our public shipyards. And this, quite frankly, is a once in a century investment. Uh, not only in, not only across uh, 20 some odd dry dock facilities that haven't seen major maintenance in almost 100 years, uh, but also the infrastructure on those shipyards as well. We have digital twins now developed of all of those, uh, all of those shipyards to give us a better understanding of what workflow optimization ought to look like, yes, and sir. that's informing our, our strategic uh, investment in those yards. And uh, and lastly, strategic sea lift. So it's an area where we really haven't made investments. In, uh, in decades, and we, our Congress, fortunately, has given us uh, the flexibility to make investments in used sea lift. We've taken a look at, uh, we've done the market analysis. We know what we want to go after at a tenth of the cost of buying new strategic sea lift, uh, and then spend a little bit of money on uh, modifications in in our private yards here in the states in order to close those gaps in sea lift yes, that we know that exists right now. So, with that, Jim, let me uh, uh, let me. Let me give it back to you, uh, the talking stick back to you, and I'm happy to take any questions. That was a big talking stick, sir. The, uh -huh. uh, just, just, I want to use your time very wisely. Um, my assumption is 300, in a, in a perfect world, you, a shift to a China fight would require resourcing top line approximately 4.1% on a sustained basis, and if I understand it correctly, it's about 2.1% inflation. Mm -hmm and then approximately 2% real growth. real growth. right. Yes, sir. And then um, within the integrated fleet naval force structure, at, which drove the, the December mm -hmm. 23 shipbuilding plan, um, the, the 355 is the, the battle, what I would refer to as battle force ships as a layman. Right. Separate from the approximate 150, 200-ish unmanned, unmanned that would then fall later right. in, uh, presumably under sea lethality, right. uh, ISR, um, logistics, and then uh, the depth of magazine and adjunct, right. something you could send out with a, a FFG-62, a conf with a frigate. Um, and then the third one, sir, I, uh, at the risk of, of giving um, red meat to, to the tiger, uh, would be the um, uh, Senator Wicker's uh, bill uh, in terms of um, first briefer we had yesterday was, as you know, um, Ranking Member uh, Whitman, right, and he immediately brought it to to all 1,000 people's attention if they hadn't already seen it. Uh, the bill to um, uh, to fence uh, uh, a portion of the uh, the for the shipyard infrastructure optimization plan, the SIOP, right, for to accelerate your four big public yards, and then the additional two billion that's in there for the, the private yards as well, right. Yes, sir. Am I missing any of the? No, I, I think that's an important point. Uh, the last point on the, on the infrastructure bill. So it really depends upon not the fund, but the funding. And so the source of that funding. And yes, so sir. if it comes out of the DOD budget, it's going to continue to pressurize us. So if it comes, yes, if it's outside of the DOD budget, it gives, gives us some relief, obviously, and allows us to, uh, to shift those funds um, elsewhere to other, to other priorities. With respect to the uh, to the 355, um, so I mentioned the the uh, force structure analysis that we did in 2020 that was really uh, approved at the end by Secretary Esper, uh, and that rigorous analysis that included uh, a red team, a China red team, so it was threat informed. We think by a very you know, good China red team, as yes, well as he brought in outside outside experts from the shipbuilding industry, principally as well as some. Uh, uh, some academics and uh, think tank think tankers, navalists, to take a look at the analysis we did and really give give him a gut check on on uh, on the rigor of it. But that analysis was the foundation of that shipbuilding plan. And so, as I mentioned earlier, it really gave us a better understanding of what we think the composition of the f future fleet ought to be, in order because having an understanding of how we're going to fight. Yes, the next question is what we're going to fight with, right? Um, and the shipbuilding plan, based on the 4.1% growth that you mentioned, that actually gave Congress and industry a set of headlights 
that said, hey, the target here in 2031 to 2033 right. is that we can deliver, we can have a Navy of 355 ships composed of these elements yes, if sir. we stay on this plan. But of course, it's all predicated on growth. Um, if, we, if we step off of that, and if the argument is, okay, you need to maintain, you still want to be in a path of 355, but to do that, you want to do it in the back of legacy fleet. I think that's a whole different conversation in terms of what the cost is that going to, what the opportunity cost of that is going to be uh, for the Navy. And I can certainly talk about that in more detail and give you some thoughts on where I think that, that kind of strategy might take us. Yes, sir. And then a, a silly question. Mm -hmm. When I, I found your, your um, December shipping plan to be very, very well articulated, mm. right? And as I, would it be inappropriate? Would, it be, would I be wrong if I, as a layman, characterized it really as uh, the, the building out the distributed maritime operations through acceleration of your frigates? Right. And then um, the logistics capability through your TAO fleet oilers, right? Um, and then uh, ultimately, um, not to be inappropriate, the kind of the big, uh, the, the rat inside the Python, sir, mm. uh, being the jump to um, three Virginias per year in approximately 2025. And then right behind that, the moving into serial production of Columbia, at about a 8 billion subsurf, right. about one per year from 2026 right. or I think 2035. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, am I missing I, any I do of think the three. I do think the three years a challenge. I think industry recognizes that, that three years a challenge. I do think that the analysis that was, that was done highlighted the fact that, look, we've got, an, we, we believe we have an advantage right now under the sea. We, yes, need, sir. To, we need to maintain that advantage and pull away. It's, yes, just, it's, it's our most survivable strike platform. Uh, it performs a heavy lift for us across the world right now, and we need, to, we need to double down on it, if you will. So it's really a challenge to industry. Can we get to a place where we can produce three a year? And I do think that that's a challenge. That's, yes, sir. Th that's, right now, the answer to that is we can't produce three a year. Let me just say that. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, and so we, need, we would hopefully get to a place where we could. But again, you know, it's going to come down to, it also is going to come down to affordability with respect to what the top line is and how much money we have left for affordable growth with respect to capacity. Yes, sir. Al, I'm hogging your time. I no, no, you. listen, I, I'm, I, 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 I got kind of, he riveted me, he, he lured me in with, with the, uh, the, de the granular details of the shipping plan. No, this, this is fascinating, Admiral, and it's a, a heck of a challenge to think about modernizing and then bringing in new technology at the same time. Right. Uh, I know very well the, the whole issues around the submarine fleet and the size of the yards, because mm -hmm. I was responsible with Hondo to make sure the nuclear force stayed on track, and it, it's a lot of building blocks. So, yep. thanks. Uh, I, I don't think you've seen your last challenge, uh, but what I'd like to do is turn this over to the questions coming in from folks. Uh, I have about eight people who want to ask you questions. Sure. And well, sir, we, we have 20, 25 minutes, if yeah, that's they, okay with you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, sir. But they didn't come here to hear me talk. They came here to hear the Admiral talk. Yeah, that's, well, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I, I wanted to make sure that we had adequate time to get to what's on people's minds. I mean, I think people yep. have heard me speak enough about um, where I think we're headed and what, what our yes, priorities sir. are. You're, you're the sizzle, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. So let's start with uh, Colin Smith uh, from Bell Flight. And it's unusual that we actually have him in the room here, so... Colin? Yeah, good morning, Admiral. <clears throat> so you mentioned industry and the partnership that you have with industry and the uh, challenges of COVID over the last year. So Bell and our partner Boeing, along with our industry partners, have been working closely with the Navy to ensure preparedness for the scheduled first deployment of the CMV-22. You also mentioned the distributed maritime operations and uh, the expeditionary advanced base operations mm -hmm. concept. So as CMV-22 gets ready to deploy for the first time, how do you envision the capabilities that it's going to bring replacing the C2 in the fleet. So first let me say I've actually flown on one out to Nimitz uh, about six weeks ago and it was a smooth ride I'll say number one uh, um, uh, and, a, and, a, and a, certainly a better ride than a C2. Um, 
we needed to replace the seat too. We've just had them. You know, they're, they're, as, they're as old as I am, uh, that airframe. And so that replacement was long overdue. I think what the, what the 22 really gives us is, a, and you kind of hinted at it, is a lot of options. Uh, I think we're going to, we're, we're uh, very optimistic right now about the reliability of that platform from a maintenance perspective, <coughs> from its performance so far in the fleet. I think this first deployment is going to tell us a lot. We'll learn from it. Uh, and I think that we will continue to experiment. I talked about those fleet battle problems, and that's where we will experiment with the 22s and push them, I think, to a greater degree to see what the art of the possible is with respect to the Marine Corps. Great, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, let's uh, now go to Megan Eckstein from uh, U.S. Naval Institute. Megan, are you back on? I am, yes, good morning, sir. Thank you so much for taking my question. Oh, Megan, it's good to see you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on the how we're going to operate piece. Sure. Um, so the Marine Corps has moved out pretty quickly on the Loki and Evo side of things. Um, they have the first Marine littoral regiments. They're standing up. They've moved out pretty quickly on the light amphib. Um, they have a 2023 deadline for kind of, you know, getting to the second iteration of the EBO manual. Um, so two part question. First is what does the Navy need to do to support the Marine Corps in their rapid timeline for working that piece of the operational concept? And then more broadly on distributed maritime operations, you mentioned the fleet battle problems. Um, I know you're picking at pieces here and there, but I wondered big picture, you know, how well do you understand DMO at this point? What work still remains? Um, you know, what do you need to do to understand any acquisition needs that will come out to support um, distributed maritime operations? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, so I met with the Commandant as recently as this morning before I, I came over here uh, just to chat really, real briefly. Um, so we talk nearly every day. Uh, and so it's, it's not uncommon for us to spend time together to talk about these very things. In terms of Navy Marine Corps integration, uh, conceptually where we're going with DMO, Logi, EABO, integrated and nested together. A lot of that, nearly all of it falls on the, on the shoulders of our fleet commanders and MU commanders. So most recently when I was in San Diego, I met with both the, the first MU commander as well as third fleet. Uh, and so this is more than just ensuring that we have Na Navy, uh, Naval officers uh, and, and Marine officers in the same staff. This is about our operations on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're integrated together and how we're experimenting and testing together. Unmanned's a really good example of that in terms of the exercise that we most recently completed. I just, the, the Seventh Fleet Commander just gave me a very detailed brief on his concept of, where the, of, of how they're gonna operate with the Marine Corps using DMO in a, uh, in a O plan like scenario, in, in, a, in a war fight. Um, uh, that Admiral Davidson has just um, updated his war plan. And so uh, very, very bullish on Navy Marine Corps integration. Uh, the flexibility that EAB EABOs give us with respect to sea control, uh, sea denial, and, and power projection. Um, so I would tell you that, that I'm very optimistic, and I think the Commandant is as well, and I want to speak for him, but our, our, uh, I think our impressions together are very positive with respect to the tempo and the pace that we're getting after it operationally. In terms of our investments, I think that's an important discussion to have. A lot of that will be driven by the top line. And then I would go back to the analysis that we've done. Uh, and the analysis, of course, I go back to the fact that the main thing that that analysis gives us is a better understanding of what the composition of the fleet ought to be with respect to lethality in particular in terms of how we're going to fight high-end competitors. And so that'll help us make, it won't make tough decisions any easier, but it will help us, I think, to make better informed decisions on where we're going to put that next dollar together. And certainly some of that is going to, is going to uh, involve the amphibious force, whether, it is, uh, whether it's big decks, whether it's LPDs, or uh, the, the dozens of light amphibious warships that we have planned for the future in order to, in order to really bring this, bring this concept to life. I hope I got at your points okay, uh, Megan. Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, next, we'll go to Vince Stametti from Serco. Vince, are you out there? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Uh, so, you know, thank you very much for taking some time with us today. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see the investment going into the public yards and the private yards. Uh, as we all know, long overdue, but most welcome. My question is, so, you know, we struggle with 
um, across the industry with labor, with skilled uh, uh, mechanics, uh, electricians, welders, that's those sort of folks. As we build up the infrastructure, are we giving any thought or have we given any thought to some sort of a people program where we start to bring in the right kind of folks and get them up to speed? That's my question. So I was just up in Bath, uh, Bath Iron Works on Monday as an example, but I could say the same thing. I could say that I could, I could speak to this with other aspects of the, uh, the aviation aspect uh, of the defense industrial base, as well as other shipyards, Bath being the most recent. And so we spent half of our time up there talking to middle-aged people that are, joining, that are joining that workforce. The most important thing that we can give uh, a company like Bath, Maine is again, that set of headlights that the, that the shipbuilding plan provides to say, look, we want to build X amount of destroyers a year. Uh, they're putting, they're putting a, a high degree of emphasis on people because at the end of the day, Bath Ironworks is a people-driven uh, uh, enterprise. And so we're giving them a set of headlights so that, they're, so that, so that they are going after those people in numbers. Uh, they're training them in the right skill sets and uh, hopefully with a healthy shipbuilding uh, fund uh, that the Congress helps us with, we can give them that degree of predictability that brings up that new generation of shipbuilder that, that, that has, you know, that builds some of the best ships in the world. I hope I get after that okay, Vince, but I, I, everywhere I go, I see people as the primary uh, focus of industry in, in terms of not only having the right workforce with the right skill sets, but also, uh, treating them as the national treasure that they are and making those long-term investments in their training and, uh, and their benefits. Yes, sir, that's uh, exactly what I was hoping to say. Thank you. Thank you. Two DDG-51 sustainable or perhaps uh, three DDG-51 sustainable depending upon the... I would, I would love it. I think we shouldn't self-limit. I don't think industry should self-limit. I think we really like those destroyers, those Flight 3 DDGs will be coming off the line around 2025. And we, yes, re we really need those ships from an air defense commander role yep. to, to backfill the cruisers, uh, yes, number one. But then DDGX, you mentioned, those hulls with a deeper magazine, where we're gonna take an existing combat system and weapon system and put it on a new hull, just like we did with the Aegis cruisers and the, and the DDG-51s uh, back in the mid 80s. So it's the same type of, uh, uh, it's the same type of vision that we have working very closely with industry. We are working very closely with them now on DDGX. And so it is a Navy lead, but we have, the, we have those prime shipbuilders involved yes, in the discussions now yes, uh, so that we get it right. Yeah. We, with, with, uh, and, I, and I've been up to Wisconsin, um, uh, FFG 62 is in a really good place. We're going to start bending metal at the end of the year on that hull. And that's going to be, uh, and that, that workforce understands how critically important the on-time delivery of that, of that ship is. And uh, kind of through the lens of success begets success, that has to be our SpaceX uh, FFG 62. We have, to, we have to get that right. And, you know, it, Industry, we win when industry wins, right? And so we're in this together. I go back to that relationship with industry, how critical it is. And we don't always agree on everything, certainly. Um, but we're dependent upon each other so much, particularly in this high-end business with shipbuilding and aircraft production. Yes, sir. And, and if I understood you correctly, not to be inappropriate, I, I, I took away kind of a telegraphing of a, a 2023, 2027, DDG-51, Flight 3, multi-year, followed by a transition into large surface combatant at that I'm time. I'm a big fan of multi-year contracts. I think, I think it's great for the Navy. I yep. think it's great for the Navy. Uh, it's great for the Navy from an affordability standpoint, but obviously it's great for industry for all the reasons that I already yes, touched sir. on with respect to predictability. It yes, gives sir. them that set of headlights. And you know, so this goes back to Vince's question about people and how that's all tied together. Um, it's critically important. And I think that you know, we're not just making these numbers up. We've done our homework. The analysis is really solid, but we're not gonna keep that uh, 2020 analysis on the shelf. 
Yes, sir. What we want to do is we want to update that periodically, right? I think that OSD will, will determine what that drum beat is. Maybe yes, it's mm -hmm. every other year where you fold in the analysis, right. the, the war games, the, uh, the results of the war games, the insights you gain, the insights of experimentation and fleet battle problems right. that give you a better understanding with respect to, to Megan's question on the maturation of of, of uh, DMO, EABO, and low Yes, sir. And, and I'm sure in no way when you were up at Bath, you mentioned their availability to uh, put the conventional price prompt strike into uh, the DDG 1000 holes by 2028, I'm sure. So, uh, so it's our goal to get to get uh, hypersonics on the Zoom waltz by, uh, by 2025. Oh, I was off by three years. I'm sorry, 20, sir. 20, Terrible. 2025. 2025, Jim. 2025. Yes, sir. I'm yep. sorry, sir. So we believe that that's a platform that we can field hypersonics on. The yes, quickest. Sir. Uh, I just talked to General McConville, the Army Chief, about their likewise their effort. They're cited on 2023 uh, yes, for their fielding of hypersonics, and so uh, that's an area where the services are working really closely together. And I think industry has been a huge help as well. I think that's going to be a good news story for the country. And a dumb question, sir: Is that order year, or is that actually a fielding date? That so that would be IOC. IOC. Yeah. Well done. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, the, I'm sorry. Yeah. You no, know, that's okay. Admiral, I would only add one thing to multi-year. Not only is it good for the Navy and good for industry, it's good for the taxpayer. Absolutely. And yep. that's, a, that's a story we don't always tell, I think. Yep. Um, it's a smart way to do business. Absolutely a smart way to do business. Uh, John Lehman from Finn Kintari, are you out there? I, I am. Uh, good morning, Admiral. Uh, uh, thanks for taking the time this morning. Uh, my question concerns the linkage between strategy and force structure. In my humble opinion, uh, far too much of the discussion about the Navy has been focused on force structure, a number of ships, yeah. and not nearly enough about the critical importance of American sea power to our security and economy, and the naval strategy from which that force structure should derive. With that as a preface, what is your view on your role as an advocate for American sea power the role of the Navy in developing strategy, and the current state of the strategy enterprise within the Navy. So, uh, John, we came out with a tri-service maritime strategy in the fall. Uh, and then nested below that is the Commandant's planning guidance, as well as my NAV plan. Both the planning guidance from the Commandant and the NAV plan for me focus us on things that we think we've got to get done this decade. There are 16 areas that I have implementation plans for that were, uh, conventional prompt strike off of Zumwalt is one of them. I want to feel this capability this, uh, this decade. So the short, uh, the bumper sticker for that, John, is I'm focused on less say and more do. That said, we've got an inter interim national security guidance. We will have a, uh, a national security guidance as well, a national security strategy as well as an upcoming national defense strategy. And so we want to make sure that we don't want to get ahead of the administration. We want to make sure that the next Navy strategy folds in neatly below that. I think that we have the pieces in place right now with the, uh, the tri-service strategy, the NAB plan, and the Commandant's guidance that get us in a good place this year, this budget cycle, and also going into 23. But I don't argue that we could do a better job of giving a better umbrella with respect to a naval strategy that could be more helpful for, for the public to understand uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. I would, though, uh, point to what happened in the Suez. You know, that I, I, that is the Navy as appreciated as it, as it should be? I like it to be appreciated a lot more. It's incidents like a ship going sideways in the Suez and the cost of $10 billion a day. And what that, when people would, if people would feel the, the results of that in their in their pocketbooks, they would value they would value the Navy so that uh, they would value the Navy more, right? Um, and so it's not until it's not until uh, it's not until that stuff is threatened that you actually get the kind of get the kind of attention that you would hope uh, the Navy would get on a day to day basis. But I appreciate the question, John. It's not lost on me the value of. Of, of a vision uh, going forward. I think we're in a pretty good place right now, but it can always be better, and I will leverage that next security strategy to take the next round turn on the, on the Navy's uh, strategy. Thank you, Adam. Good. Thank you, John. Uh, Aiden Quigley from Inside Defense. Are you out there? 
Yep, I'm here. Thanks again uh, for doing this. Uh, I have a question on the light aircraft carrier concept. Sure. Uh, I know the Navy is uh, planning an AOA uh, in 2022, uh, and I'm curious if you think that light carriers have a role in the uh, fleet of the future. I, I won't say they don't have a role. I think they deserve more study. And so when we had these discussions with Secretary Esper as we were putting the final touches on the analysis that we did, um, I advocated for separating light carriers from supercarriers in that analysis. Uh, the reason I did that is because um, any, any uh, uh, our conceptual understanding of what a light carrier would bring to the fight was rather, was rather thin. Um, Supercarriers, much more well established, of course. But I also think that you're potentially comparing apples and oranges if you put them in the same line. Right. That is to say that I don't believe that they ought to necessarily compete against each other, right? And so I think that potentially, uh, potentially, Aiden, I think that we could take a look at a light carrier, or we might call it instead of a light carrier, the aviation combatant of the future that could fill roles with, with w certainly with unmanned. Uh, possibly DCA functions, possibly ISR and targeting functions, right? Where you could relieve the supercarrier or the platforms in the supercarrier for those roles. I'm just giving you a for instance. This is, there's no analysis that underpins what I'm saying. But I'm just saying that conceptually, I think there could be a role, right? And I think that we, we, we shouldn't dismiss that. Uh, and, and we are taking that seriously. And the discussions in the Pentagon about potentially what an aviation combatant of the future could bring to the fight in a, distribu in a distributed environment is potentially powerful. So uh, it's not off the table. It's just really early here in the, uh, in the discussions. My recollection is you have plenty of time. Because you're- We do. You're, that's the we, next we, order of yours, not we do. until we do. 2028, we do. I guess. We do. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I, I will tell you, with respect to Ford, if I could just give a shameless plug for Ford. Yes, sir. Ford has spent half of the past year at sea. She has been our carrier qual CVN off the East Coast for the past several months. Yes, sir. That is not insignificant for a carrier that hasn't yet even deployed, right? Uh, we've done uh, over 8,000 cats and traps off the deck of that aircraft carrier with a very, very high degree of reliability with her, uh, with, with her, her uh, arresting gear as well as her catapult system. Uh, if you talk to the crew on that ship, particularly in the cat, those that work in the catapults and those that work in the, arrest, in the arresting gear, these are the same sailors that left the left Nimitz class and they're not looking back. They really love the Ford. Um, mm -hmm. for, we're, we're ahead of schedule with respect to her work. We're entering the phase now where she's going to do shock trials this summer. We're going to take her into another short maintenance availability. And my uh, goal is to get her out to sea in 22, uh, doing something substantive. And so uh, I'm very, very happy with the path run at Ford. The embarked air wing uh, has been very, very satisfied with, with the performance of the ship, as, as, uh, as has been the strike group commander. The last thing I'll say with Ford, the Ford class has to do with directed energy and the fact that 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 uh, class of ship produces power at three times the rate that, or three times the, the capacity that the Nimitz class did. And so uh, there is uh, room there in terms of space, in terms of cooling, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of electrical power for directed energy capability. Right. And so that is the future for me with respect to fleet survivability as an important part of layer defense. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I just think, I, I'll just make an editorial comment. It's fascinating the way the last two questions in the tri-service plan came together. So the concept formerly known as the light aircraft carrier um, it will be informed by what the Brits do with some of their smaller ships, will be informed right. by what we have to do in a China fl fight, and it will be different. And, you know, I, I, I commend Admiral and the Navy for not jumping to a solution based upon a platform that is there. We have to think our way through it because right. a fight with the lines of communication into the Westpac are so different. <coughs> and that will take a whole different concept. And, you know, think about distributed maritime operations. There could be air, uh, the light air, air platforms in, uh, embedded in that. Right. So I, I applaud the fact that they're taking time to think their way through it rather than just spending yes, money. And we are we are trying to move very deliberately, right? Um, particularly if you take a look at Unmanned as an example, to put us in a place where we're confident enough 
to then pull the string and say, okay, now we're ready to scale this. Now we're ready to scale large unmanned surface, medium unmanned surface, right. and bring those capabilities to bear, uh, and to sail those with, uh, with frigates, let's say, or, or flight three DDGs. But we're, gonna, we're taking a deliberate approach. Uh, it's the same thing with the design of the, uh, the DDGX. And so um, I'm trying to make sure that, although, although it's important to move with a sense of urgency in this decade, that we're also doing it deliberate and in a manner that we're not going to regret those decisions a decade from now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so Richard Abbott from Defense Daily. Are you out there, Richard? Nope. Give him some. Well, Richard, I, I think if you are on mute, uh, we're going to go on to uh, Reginald Robinson from BAE. Reginald, you on? Hey, I, I'm on. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Admiral. And thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Uh, in your opening remarks, you talked about the relationship with industry, and I could not agree more. Uh, we can't overstate the importance of having robust and ongoing dialogue between the department and industry. So my question is along that line, and it really dovetails with what Vince asked earlier about the workforce. So what we're seeing are some indications of early decommissioning of ships, um, primarily cruisers and LSDs that are driving severe workload reductions, uh, primarily in Norfolk. Um, and if the Navy moves forward with these early decom plans, is there a plan to backfill the workload to stabilize the workforce and the, work, and the, and the workload in places like Norfolk? And if it's primarily looking at um, preservation of the ship repair industrial base, it, which is a critical component to what the Navy is looking to do in terms of increased ships in the fleet. So uh, let me talk about predictability if we can, and it has to be a fiscally informed plan. So based on the budget that the Navy has, that the, based on our top line over the past few years, the Navy, we think, uh, an affordable size is about 300 to 305 ships. So if you take a look at where we've been putting our money uh, in order to sustain those numbers, if I go back to kind of our priorities in our, in our three bins, um, people. So we have funded an additional almost 25,000 billets over the past few years. We're filling magazines with munitions where we haven't before, as an example, uh, and other uh, high-tech equipment. We are, we are accelerating our migration to the cloud with respect to, uh, with respect to our networks. And so, uh, and, and so from a wholeness perspective, um, 300 to 305 is my side picture right now in order to have a Navy that's sustainable. What I don't want to do is get to a place where if, 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 for example, if somebody's strategy is keep everything that you got, buy as much new as you can, you know, and if, it's, easy to, it's easy to make those assertions, but they have to be fiscally informed or if we're forced to keep everything that we have, yes, if we're sir. forced to buy as much new as we can, the, the, the money's going to have to come from somewhere inside that budget. And even though the Navy has found $40 billion across the fit-up uh, in some of our reform efforts last year, and we're putting $7 billion towards shipbuilding as, as an example this year, that's not a recipe for success in the long term in, ta in terms of maintaining a, a healthy fleet. And what I get concerned about when people talk about you know, uh, just keeping everything that you got and buying as much as you can, is that the risk is going to be driven down, and we've seen this before, on our 05 uh, level COs, on our commanders of those ships and their crews. And so every decommission for me, uh, sir, is a very, very deliberate decision in terms of war fighting capacity, what we're giving up, what we could potentially gain from that. Um, a, a, real, a real life example here with, with the cruisers, which are now over 30 years old, um, we were deploying a cruiser last month out of Norfolk. We had to bring that cruiser back twice to repair cracked fuel tanks. There are unknown unknowns with these vessels now that right. we can't predict. To, to your point about the workforce, I think if what I want to be able to do is say, I, I, don't want to be, I don't want to kid anybody. I want to say, look, this is the size of the fleet that I think the Navy can uh, sustain. If I go back to thing one that I said in my original uh, remarks is that my responsibility is to fund and field the most lethal, capable, ready Navy every single day and into the future. 
That's what I'm focused on. And I'll be honest with the Congress based on the analysis we're doing, this is the composition of the fleet that I think we ought to have to fight. And based on the budget that we have, this is what I think we, we can afford. I'm trying to, I, I'm giving you a roundabout uh, answer. I'm, I'm, try, I'm not trying to be evasive at all. I'm just trying to talk about the different factors that are involved that are influence our decision making and making those very deliberate decisions to cut ships. And I'm trying to give ship builders and ship repair facilities the best set of headlights so that they can plan into the future. And predictable, stable budget uh, lines from Congress yes, sir. are the best way to do that. And, and just to be clear, sir, you had mentioned the, the how many should be thinking there's four LCS in a perfect world that the first four you'd want right. to bring, bring out. And right. then, how many should we be thinking for CG47s and LSDs? So I, I don't want to get I don't want to get in front of the budget yes, on sir, those numbers with respect, <laughs> with, with respect to those. But you know, with respect to LSDs, that is a deep conversation with the commandant of the Marine Corps and his staff, and a very deliberate. Those are very deliberate decisions to make before you take combat capability out the yes, field. Sir. But I go back to everything that I just kind of laid out for Reginald in terms of what has to you have to. You have to keep it real. You can't just, I can't just make stuff up with respect to saying we're going to keep these ships and we're going to keep the magazines full yes, and we're going to keep them fully manned and we're going to keep them fully trained and, you know, uh, uh, and on and on and on. Um, with respect to the LCS, so those first four LCSs were designated test platforms back in 2016. We've invested nothing in those first four with respect to any of, uh, any of the upgrades to their engineering plants or their hull and mechanical systems or their combat systems. So that's two and a half billion if we want to make those investments in those four ships. That's money that we could put against four right. new frigates as an example. So those are the kinds of conversations that we need to have inside the Pentagon with Congress and with industry, but we need to keep it real in terms of you know, yes, sir. hey, I, I'm, I'm trying to make these decisions as unemotional and as factually based as I can. Yes, Jim, I, I will give you the bumper sticker if I can, Admiral. I came on active duty in the mid-70s. <clears throat> we had a hollow force. Yeah. What I just heard is the Admiral saying we're going to do everything we can to prevent having a hollow force exactly. in the future. Yes, sir, yeah. and for that, you should be applauded. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, yeah, sir. I, I echo vote. that, um, Admiral. Oh, wait. Go Thank ahead, you sir. very much for the, the candor and, as, as you said, keeping it real. We definitely appreciate the comments. Thanks, Mr. Robinson. You, you were just about to, to leave us with the, I know it's going to be the Suez Canal issue, oh. uh, with the, uh, the message to the, uh, the wheat farmer in Oklahoma about what, uh, what you bring to the, uh, to the China fight. American prosperity floats on seawater, and so 90% of our global trade uh, we are a maritime nation. Um, if, you, if we take a look at what's going on with the Colonial Pipeline, and if we, let's say, let's say there is uh, uh, some type of physical um, uh, obstruction in the Strait of Hormuz that interrupts oil flow, even though the United States receives very little, if any, oil from the Middle East these days, it's a global commodity. Yes, so sir. we are gonna, the perturbations of that for the American taxpayers at the gas pump are going to be felt. You need, a, you need a navy forward to prevent conflict. You need a navy forward. That's where you want a navy. If you do get in a scrap, you want it far, far away from the United States of America, number one. That we want to be able to deter, right? To make Russia and China wake up every day and, and, and say to themselves, today is not the day. Yes, I'm sir. looking at the Theodore Roosevelt off my coast with the Macon Island Arg. Today is not the day. Um, and then with respect to, with respect to sea lanes um, and the stuff that we do day in and day out with our allies and partners is just fantastic. I, I, the first Sea Lord uh, from the Royal Navy was here last week. We had long discussions about not only what we're doing with the Queen Elizabeth and we have a U.S. ship deployed with her, the, the, the USS the Sullivans. Uh, we also have a, a Marine Corps F-35 squadron on board. Powerful, powerful uh, collaboration there. So. Well spoken. I, 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 this is a terrible. We used every minute, sir. I feel like I was been throwing uh, red meat to the tiger. Well, thanks. And it keeps getting bigger, bigger and tougher, sir. I appreciate. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. I appreciate the questions, and uh, I always, uh, we always appreciate your support. Yes, so sir. Well spoken, sir. Thank you.